Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I'm Alex Greenwood. You know, it's been said that creativity doesn't wait for that perfect moment. It fashions its own perfect moments out of ordinary ones. That was artist Bruce Gerbrandt who said that. Another guy who was pretty smart said, creativity is seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. Uh, you may have heard of that guy, Albert Einstein. He did something important. I don't know. Hey, if you're a regular listener to the show, you know that examining creativity from where it springs, the ways that it's applied to writing and other artistic endeavors is a topic of fascination for me. We have interviewed dozens of writers, artists, musicians, photographers, and many more people who you would naturally assume are creative. But what about everyone else? Can creativity be taught? Can it be instilled in corporate culture? We're going to find out on today's show as we welcome Nir Bashan, a world-renowned creativity expert. Nir, welcome to Mysterious Goings On. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. By way of introduction, Nir has taught thousands of leaders and individuals around the globe how to harness the power of creativity to improve profitability, increase sales, and ultimately create more meaning in their work. Nir has spent the last two decades working on a formula to codify creativity. The formula is found in the creator mindset, which has been translated into two languages. He was one of the youngest professors ever selected to teach graduate courses at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and also taught undergraduate courses at the University of California at Los Angeles. He's worked on numerous albums, movies, and advertisements with famous actors and musicians, ranging from Rod Stewart to Woody Harrelson. All right. There's, there is a, that's a, that's a gamut that, you're running right that, there. That's a, that's a range. Yeah. He's work on creativity. He has uh, won a Clio award. That's a big advertising agent. That's a big ad agency. Oh, that's the Oscars of ads, right? I believe. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and he's Emmy nominated as well. He is the founder and CEO of the creator mindset LLC, a company that conducts workshops, consulting, coaching, and keynote speeches at conferences and corporate events. His clients include AT&T, Microsoft, Ace Hardware, NFL Network, EA Sports, Suzuki, Activision, and JetBlue. Again, welcome near, uh, apparently you have some credentials here. Ah, thank you, good sir. Yeah, you, the way you make it sound is way better than what it is in real life. I'm available for, uh, I can record that for you, put it on the, uh, put it on the, <laughs> the thing there. And just you There know, we go. There you go. It cost you like a whole Starbucks gift card. Near, <laughs> I want to tell you, man, I, I am thrilled that we got, we got connected because as I mentioned previously, and you and I talked off air briefly, uh, creativity is at the heart of mysterious goings on. And it, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but a lot of people think creativity is a mystery. You have a slightly different take on this, don't you? Yeah, slightly different. So I believe that creativity is something that can be taught uh, to anybody, and it just takes the will to learn. It's a tool like any other Alex that um, we can develop. And really for me, it's something that we can redevelop because what I believe is that we were all born creative as children and somewhere along the road, somewhere along the line, we've just stopped listening to our creativity, uh, our creative thoughts and our, our creative uh, t tendencies. And we've just kind of, uh, you know, went headlong as, as a society, as people, no matter what culture across the uh, across the globe into analytics spreadsheet logic and all this type of thinking that i think is not um it's not great for humanity you know i've often thought that uh, our education system is somewhat at fault for this because we i think our education system to a large degree is aimed at making us uh, good workers but not necessarily good problem solvers and thinkers Absolutely. So we found, so I, we did some research with the book and we found that uh, right about kindergarten, a shift starts to occur where teachers start to look for the right uh, answer, not the creative answer. Mm -hmm. And we systematically, you know, throughout high school and in the college and grad school and PhD school and all that, we start looking for the right answer instead of the creative answer. And I think that that starts to put people on a headlong course into analytical thinking and away from creative thinking. I had this in my own experience when I was in the corporate world uh, that I have, I had, I've told this anecdote before, but you haven't heard it. Uh, I had a boss who said, and I, I guess I was the closest thing to the creative one on staff. It was for a large nonprofit huge national nonprofit. Yeah. And she, we needed to do something in my area where our territory covered two States. And she says, uh, Alex, just go use your creativity and, and come up with something here as if it was something I could pull out of a drawer <laughs> yeah. and say, wait a minute, I've got to use my creativity. I hope it's a USB uh, port will work with this thing. But anyway, so I, I, that seems to be kind of a good corporate thinking going on here. And, but your focus seems to be telling leaders in corporate America and telling 
people who work in corporate America that, or corporate the world, I guess, that creativity is not some kind of mysterious, weird thing that, that only a certain couple of people on staff can, can access. That's right, Alex. Yeah. So I have a book coming out in August. Uh, it's a McGraw-Hill release book called The Creator Mindset, where we focus really on actionable tools that anybody can use to become creative. Now, here's the cool part. Um, I, I, think, I think you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, we did some research and, you know, uh, I'm big into research. I like research. I'm not an academic, but I like research, right? And so we did some, some, some studies and uh, really looked deep. And it is the only book that we were able to find, Alex, that is um, a codification of creativity. So I think, I'm pretty sure, uh, we, we, we dug pretty deep that this is the only book out there that teaches people the how of creativity. So this book, no matter who you are, will enable you to become creative just by kind of following the steps. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, do you want to give us just a kind of a quick example of how that might work? Sure. So there's a chapter in there called the uh, Trinity of Creativity, and it's, it's the third or fourth chapter in the book. We're talking, you know, 40, 50 pages in, boom, we're already on process and protocol. And basically, uh, creativity can be made. Uh, it just takes, again, the will to learn and the will to want to do it. So there's three pieces of creativity. One is called the uh, concept the other is called the idea and the third is called the execution. And what I do is I teach you how to use those three elements, combine them together and manufacture your own ideas. Just as if you were to look at a spreadsheet and, you know, run a formula to get column A and column C together. This is literally a formula on how to get creativity going and inspiring new and interesting innovation. Is this something that you advise readers to do just one-on-one -on, -one on their own, or is this something that groups can do, or is, is, can your book be brought into a conference room with people and taught to them? Definitely. So you can either um, do the creativity by yourself and, and kind of learn and, and um, you know, sit down and kind of do it, or you can do it with a group. It, it works both ways. The, the, the cool part is that I think what, what, what I'm seeing is that people are gravitating toward a, a sort of a process of creativity that they've never before imagined was possible. Um, you know, Alex, you're in PR, right? So you know mm -hmm. this stuff uh, inside out, but, um, you know, we look around and we see people that are creative and we wish they could, we could be them, right? And, mm -hmm. and I've, I've spent the last 20 years trying to, you know, figure out why, why some companies are successful and some are not. And you look at capital, you look at, you know, their product or their service, and there's a lot of reasons. But what I've found time and time again is that the companies that are most successful, the employees that are most successful, the, you know, you know people on their way to the top are almost always creative and nobody's kind of telling you, you know, nobody's, nobody's given up the secrets. So, um, so I spent 20 years getting it wrong. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've had my own businesses. I've run other people's businesses. You name it. I've done it. I, I refurnished furniture. Uh, I had a uh, business uh, doing that for a while. I, you know, ran advertising agencies for a while. And time and time again, I've seen people that are creative do well. And I've asked them, okay, what are you doing? How do you do it? And nobody told me, you know, they would be like, ha, yeah. You know, they, they, they guarded it like it was their IP. But it's time for the world to kind of see how to become creative. And that's what I'm really excited about this thing, um, this thing going out. So yeah, groups uh, by yourself with, you know, with some close friends, there's really a process of how to run creativity and, and make it at the drop of a hat. You just have to want to do it. You know, near that, uh, as a writer too, uh, I write mystery novels and stuff on the side. And That's right. It's, it's basically a hobby because I don't make any real money in it, but, but, the, but the I mean, they're successful books, right? They do okay. They do they okay. They do good. I mean, yeah. no, nobody's looking at them and going, oh, man, this is terrible. Um, <laughs> so, they, so they do all right. They, and uh, my big deal is I don't have to get rich. I just, it'd be nice to make a little living and entertain people. So it seems to be working. My point, too, is like you're talking about this, like uh, people who kind of guard the, the whole, how do you do it? I've had other writers say to me, or want to be writers, and I don't say want to be like disparaging, but want to be writers. So how do you do it? And I'm, I'm like, well, I get my butt in the seat. And I, <laughs> That's the first thing. You got to sit down. Right. In front Step of the one. Step one. In front of the keyboard to get a pad out. You got to go. And then I just let, you know, I just let my mind go. And 
once I get into a groove, the characters tell me where we're going. I'm not to get off on, on, on writing tangent, but, but, but when I hear this though, it sounds to me like you're, you're developing ways to help remove that block that people have been told, or maybe the, you know, they've been figuratively had the creativity beaten out of them since they were kids. You're finding ways to remove those blocks and to give them permission to be creative. Yep. You, you bet. Um, it's really permission to fail and permission to purge your sort of self-doubt monster. So we all have this kind of monster living within us. And, and I suspect that your friends that are, are trying to write something are perhaps maybe dominated by the sense of failure and the sense of self-doubt, which kind of go hand in hand. And we talk about that in the book. But, you know, for me, it's a discipline and it is learning how to give yourself permission to fail um, and learning from failure. Failure is okay. There's a bunch of different failures. You know, there's the failure where you don't wear uh, glasses and in in, in you work in manufacturing and you get something in your eye. That, there's, nothing, there's nothing good about that kind of failure. That's kind of a systematic, you know, uh, uh, failure of not following protocol. The failure that I'm talking about is really intelligent failure, right? It's when you sit and try to do something um, that, you know, maybe it's never been done before, or you, you're not good at. Mm. Um, and through the process of doing it, yes, you can, you can, um, you can fail and it's okay to fail. So part of what, what we talk about in the book on, you know, on failure is really getting your butt in the seat and doing it and allowing yourself to let go. Alex, I cannot tell you how many times, you know, I work, uh, I consult or, you know, I'm, I'm giving a keynote and somebody comes up to me afterwards and, you know, they're, they're like so excited, but they're so afraid to just, you know, they, oh, I got to A goes to B and B goes to C, but what if, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And, you know, you could sense the anxiety and I just want to tell them to let it go. Yeah. Um, just give yourself permission to do something different. I like the, the, the permission to fail. Um, and th that scares people, I think, a little. The word failure has been drummed into us as being horrible, but that's how you learn, obviously. Yes. So you do give a lot of talks. And of course, with COVID, I know that's probably slowed down a little bit. <laughs> I yes. mind too. I, all my top talks dried up. I'm not a big fan of the, doing the webinars. I'm trying to transition. But uh, you, you would think I'd have no problem with it doing this all the time. But I yes. just, I don't know. I don't, I miss the connection with people. I, yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, we're connecting, but it's it, the energy when you're speaking from the in audience. Person. Yeah, it's just really, it's, it's incredible. But right, right. So, but you've been doing the speaking and you're consulting with companies. I would just love to hear uh, perhaps some of the objections maybe you got from CEOs or C-suite folks or, or HR people, whoever it is you came in to talk to about what you're going to do. Right. I want to hear the objections. Right. So we get, you know, I get a lot of, you know, overall, Alex, I get a lot of this, right? Um, I get somebody who's running a company, been running it for a while, or somebody in the C-suite, um, you know, going, this is, this is great, right? This is nice. Um, creativity is fantastic. But, you know, what does it really do for me? What does it do for the bottom line? And, you know, how does it really work? Because, um, you know, I've got a business to run. Um, I've got, you know, a, a product to get out and, and so on and so forth. I've got a factory to run. And really, the, the number one objection that I get uh, when out speaking about the creator mindset and speaking about how to shift your mentality from analytic to creative is that, you know, how does this stuff really work hmm. and what's it going to do for me? So for that, I, I have kind of two, two points of perspective. One is that I tell people that they were born creative, um, even though they don't think so. I get a lot of pushback on that one. Hmm. Um, people are like, well, Nir, I don't play an instrument. Uh, I'm not a trumpeteer or, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not a jazz pianist. So how, how, how am I possibly, I don't paint. How am I creative? And so I tell them, you know, what we talked about a little bit earlier, how we're all creative and we kind of get that beat out of us really. Um, and, you know, and I tell them that, that creativity is trying to bubble up through their, their, con their you know, <laughs> subconscious if they just listen. And so the conversation begins to get, become, you know, one of not, hey, near, I don't want any part of this. It becomes, well, well, wait a second. How does it bubble up? I say, okay, C-suite, perfect example. I say, you're lying in bed at night, right? Before a day, let's say there's a meeting, a client call, something important, right? Um, are, you fast, are you fast asleep at, you know, 930 or whenever you go to bed? And they're like, no, I'm up. 
I'm like, right, when do you go to bed? They're like, oh, when I could, I'm, I'm playing, I'm doing this great chess game in my mind, right? If they say this, I say that, and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, what are, you, what are your ideas that pop up? They're like, oh, I got a bunch. So A, B, and C, I got a bunch of ideas. I say, well, that's creativity popping up. <laughs> <laughs> so that is literally you trying to solve problems through a creative lens. They're like, yeah, that's, that's really cool. I say, well, wouldn't you want to learn how to do that without being up at night? Uh, you know what I mean, Alex? Like, yes. <laughs> that's, you got to let go, man. So wouldn't you want to be somebody who can be creative during the day, kind of shut it down, close the machine, shut off your phone, and then be with your family, friends, or whatever else you want to do, sleep soundly, and then be able to turn on and off that ability? And that's when I start to kind of make headway with the naysayers. I like that too, because um, I, I talked to this uh, interview with the my previous guest with an author about how just uh, shutting and off. She was great. Oh, thank you. Adriana. That was a good one. Yeah. Gavazzoni, she's a delight. Uh, thank you for listening. And she, she and I were talking about how we both do just, not mind, not necessarily mindless things. We will do. I talk about how I take six mile hikes and those things, and that seems to be when because everything else is turned off. I don't have the distractions other than the walk, right? Yes. Then, but then I, I seem to be more receptive near to to whatever that is. But I, I like what you're saying because typically. Um, even last night before I went to bed, I thought, gosh, have I prepared enough to talk to Nir Bashan? This guy is going to eat my lunch if I don't know <laughs> something. So, so that's all going. And then I started thinking, no, you do this and this and this. And, but my point being, um, it, it would be great if you could just find those points of entry where you can receive, because that, that's something you really opened me up to here, You're, how creativity is trying to bubble to the surface, but you're yes. kind of, you're tamping Constantly. it down. Yeah, you're tamping it down like it's anxiety. It's not necessarily anxiety, is it? It's actually your brain saying, hey, I think I can help you with this. Yes, it's exactly <laughs> right. That is exactly right. So if, if I were to put you on the spot here, and you can cuss me and go, I didn't really plan for this question, Alex, but all right, here we go. Is there somebody out in corporate America now, a leader? Uh, oh, you know, I mean, we can, I guess you could say Oprah or somebody like that, but is there a corporate leader out there that you know of that maybe not everybody's heard of necessarily who you, you just look at and go, that person gets it. That person's doing it. Yes. So, the, so definitely there are people in the U S and internationally right now um, that are doing, you know, amazing creative things. Um, there's not enough of them. I'll, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> um, I like what Elon Musk is. It's an obvious mm -hmm. answer, but it's good because it's, it, it is, it's good stuff. I like what he's doing with Tesla. I like what Amazon is doing um, in terms of their customer approach. Um, you know, relentless and, um, you know, utterly approachable. Constantly, you know, following up, making sure people are happy. Um, those are two companies that I think are doing uh, a really good job. But it's also, you know, the dry cleaner here on the corner that's sending me, you know, a coupon for a free dry cleaning. Um, and I'm like, this guy's on to something, right? And then you go into the dry cleaners and you find out that, you know, um, he does a monthly package where you can come in as much as you want and it's, you know, a, a certain amount of money. And you go, wow, these are really creative you know, uh, sort of um, implementations. And what I want to see is commerce um, driven more by the creative side uh, than the analytical side. I mean, listen, you have to have both of them in harmony uh, to do anything, right? Because if right. your creative side is overwhelming your analytical side, you're, that's not good either. But right now we have sort of shifted into the analytical side being way greater than the creative side and, and that that needs to be fixed but those two companies are doing good work but there's also local heroes doing amazing things i'll tell you what my brother is a chef and through covid he's doing amazing things they they're you know they're they're preparing meals to go family of four you know with a set price and he's throwing in stuff groceries, um, items that he gets from the purveyors, stuff like that. I think he's, he last did a mystery box where people are so happy with his product that they don't even know what they're going to get for dinner in the box, right? But they show up and, you know, they kind of open it and they're, oh, cool, you know, um, a, a, a shaved fennel kit, you know, to put on a, a salad or whatever. And, and people have never had fennel before, you know, and they're getting to explore what that is like uh, um, you know, with their meal. So what I think is happening, Alex, is there's, you know, especially with COVID now, people are being forced into creative solutions and, you know, forced outside of their comfort zone, uh, which I think is a wonderful thing.
I love that example. Uh, we've had a, a, a restaurant industry expert on the show a couple of times, and yeah. he he was uh, Brian Hutton, and we were talking about a lot of these things. And he said this pandemic is not a blessing necessarily, but it is going to teach companies, at least the ones that survive, how to pivot and how to get through here. Your brother sounds like he's doing incredible. Work. Is he in? By the way, just by uh, is he in Orlando area like you, or is he elsewhere? No, he's in Portland. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, oh, yeah he's wow. in Portland. Yeah, well, but uh, but he's hanging in there, right? So he's hanging in there. He's you know he's getting creative. There, you know, everybody's it, 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 and it's outside his comfort zone. He's not like you know near. This is the best thing ever. He's kind of like oh, you know, what do, what do I need to do to survive? But Alex, it's not you know that's not when creativity should kick in. Only when we need to survive. Right, right. We right. should use that. You know, we should use that every day. And like here he is going, oh, you know, we're about to go out of business. And it's not just him; it's millions of other people, millions. And right now we need something that we can kind of, you know, have in our hands and, you know, flip through a few pages and go, okay, this is what I need to, to do to be creative and not stay up all night thinking about the ideas and, and, and worrying about this or that, letting it go a little bit and then coming up with a process to solve, solve our problems. Today's, you know, today's problems are different. They're different than they've ever been. Creativity isn't always about creating is it is it also about identifying an opportunity and let me just give you a quick anecdote yeah. why i'm asking you that question who used to be now i'm older than you obviously but i think you, who used to be the gold standard for photography what company comes to mind kodak kodak okay you already know where i'm going rochester <laughs> new york you know uh what 20 25 years ago yep they they were it and they they weren't going anywhere everything was cool then the digital photography boom started coming this is before Everybody had a phone in their pocket, which also devastating to people who make you know, manufacture film and cameras. Yeah. But at the time, it was just people wanted the digital cameras. But Kodak thought it was a fad or just didn't recognize it. I, and my thinking is they were not creative thinkers and they were not creative enough to look, as I always say, which is what I like to do for my clients, is they could not look around the corner, if that makes sense, and see yeah. this could potentially put us out of business. Is that a good example or am I kind of – trying to shove a square peg in a round hole on that. No, you're spot on. Basically, there's a chapter in the book about Kodak uh, oh. in the creator mindset. Yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, there's a guy there in the mid-70s, I believe. The date's right in the book, but I think it's the mid-70s, a guy named Steve Sasson. And believe it or not, um, Alex, Steve Sasson came out with the first digital camera at Kodak. He was a Kodak engineer who wow. came out with the first digital camera at Kodak. I mean, can you imagine a better company to go along with your, with your question, which I think is, is a really, really good one. It's so good that I devoted a chapter of the book to it. You can't imagine a better company to have digital technology, digital photo technology than Kodak, right? So what happened? He presented it and it went to meeting after meeting and the whole deal. And there was kind of an old guard at Kodak. And they basically told him that nobody would ever want to take a picture digitally. Can you imagine? And they said that nobody would ever want to look at a photo unless it's on paper. Because there's an experience looking at a photograph on paper. I, I, when was the last time you saw a photo on paper? If it wasn't in a frame on my desk. Yeah. That's so, it. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, they basically buried the technology. So part of being creative, yes, is not just, you know, creativity, but it's also how to use it, you know, to productize uh, ideas and to recognize when it's there. So I, I devoted another chapter in the book to talking about how to champion creative creativity uh, once it's there, because the story of the amount of companies that had uh, amazing creative um sort of tool, technique, process, or product to take out and chose not to is staggering. Uh, yeah, that alone interests me. I consider myself to be a very uh, creative uh, person, obviously, but I, I, I love to read those kinds of things. I like to, I, case studies, more or less, basically, yeah. of how it's done. Um, uh, and Nir, I think you'll get along, you'll agree with this because you've kind of already alluded to it about speaking. Some of the best talks I give or the best seminars or workshops I give is when I detail my failures. Yeah. When, where, things where I, I saw something and just thought, nah, 
not going to happen. And I was totally <laughs> wrong, right? I'm not even going to tell you the stuff that I, I could have been ahead on. But anyway, but we all have those feelings. You all think, right. oh, I, I could have, I had an, an idea for that. I, I could have invented uh, the electric car. I just didn't feel like it. But, you know, it's also <laughs> just that um, people like to hear failure because, one, I think it gets back to what you said. You, you're giving people permission to be creative and just saying to them, look, Stephen King is super creative and he never doesn't have a best selling book anymore, right? They're always best sellers, but hey, he, he's human just like you. Now he's extremely talented, but he does not, he's never let anybody tell him you're not creative. That's part of the deal. Yes. Yes. So part of the deal really is to shift your mentality into thinking that you are creative too. And, you know, with a proper, pro listen, I'm, I'm not telling you that you're going to become the next Stephen King. I don't know. Maybe. Um, I will tell you this is that there's probably have been thousands, thousands of others like him that have edited themselves to death and have, you know, talk themselves out of it and, you know, completely derail themselves from, um, from being great because they, they killed their own idea. I'm telling you, um, Alex, the power of our negativity <laughs> oh, yeah. and our self doubt is one of the most powerful things on earth. I think it's, you know, you want to talk about, uh, you know, anything that you could think of was awesome power, right? Um, we think of, of the atomic bomb or something, you know, crazy like that, but far crazier and far more um, meaningful, I think, is the one-on-one -on -one individual who's shutting down their potential because they don't think it's good enough. How do they know it's not good enough? You look at, uh, um, you know, J.K. Rollins, who wrote, uh, of course, the, the, the famous... Um, uh, series. She, she got rejected what, like for three or four years. I mean, you know a oh, little yeah. bit about that story. Oh, I do. Um, 17 rejections. And then finally found a little publisher that was willing to take the book out. There's those stories abound. Um, and so what I want to help people do is to sort of throw off those shackles of, of restraint that they put on themselves over years and years of self doubt and just shake them off and do something, uh, do something cool, do something creative, something different, not talking about playing the piano, not talking about playing an instrument. I'm talking about being the best, you know, nail and hair salon in central Florida. If that's what you want to do. I'm talking about being the best manufacturer in Northern Colorado that makes, you know, machine uh, grade, uh, military grade machine parts for, you know, I I'm talking about using what you already have in you to yeah. your full potential. So is the book written the way you're talking to us right now? Because this yes. sounds like, uh, is it you? Is it near, or is it, it's not a textbook. Now McGraw Hill's putting this out. So I, my first thought was one prestigious, but two textbook. Textbook. Yeah, definitely. No, it's, uh, it's, so they have a business department that puts out about uh, 40 or 50 books a year or so. Um, mm -hmm. I have to find out exactly, but, um, but yeah, it's not a textbook. It's a, it's a business book um, written by somebody who, you know, who's in the business. And that's, that's me. I, I'm not an academic. I wish I was smarter. I taught <laughs> um, in colleges and that, that was cool. Um, I'd like to do it again, actually. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm a business leader, a, a person who's run companies both successfully and, and incredibly unsuccessfully. And I got to tell you, I've learned way more in, in, you know, difficult times and in unsuccessful times than I've had in successful times. Well, I, I tell people I've went to the kindergarten of hard knocks and the, and got a PhD from the, uh, University of getting the crap kicked out of me, you know, that's, that's there you not, go. That's not an original uh, uh, line, but that's what I tell people. And it's just true. And that's just life. Well, okay, near. All right. So uh, clock on the walls tell me I'm going to lose you now. But really quickly, where can people find more about you? And then where can they pre order this book? Where can I go pre order? Because I got to go do that. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, the book is on Amazon right now and Barnes and Noble and every pretty much anywhere you like to buy books. All the independent shops have it. We're in pre-order right now. So you, you go and you order it and you get a copy on the 4th of, of August. So it's, it's available. It's available everywhere. My, my website is nearbashan.com. It's my name, N-I-R-B-A-S-H-A-N.com. And the book's website is thecreatormindset.com. Nothing well, too creative there. 
<laughs> <laughs> it it means what it says and it says what it does and but um there'll be links in the show notes uh, near i'm gonna throw it back to you one last thought it, one last thought we didn't cover anything you want to make sure people understand about why they need to get this book and why they also probably should get on your email list i see you have one right yes yes the email list we send out um emails every once in a while we try not to be annoying mm. um so if it is annoying please tell me uh, just send us an email because that's the last thing we want to do. We want to enhance and add value, right. not, you know, waste people's time. I'm on so many email lists. I'm, I bet you are too, Alex. Yeah. Like, do you, do you like wade through the crap? Like, you're like, enough, enough. I don't need something every day. I got the Unroll Me app and, and everything's put in there. And then I thought, well, then I don't look at it. Why am I subscribing? <laughs> It's just, but it's what you do, right? And uh, no, but I can do. tell. But it, you know, you're offering value here, and I'm the same way. I, I have a, a list, but I, I don't send out much simply because they can get me in so many other places. But yeah, when I do send something, it's because I really believe it has some value, and I, I try to that. do that. Yeah, I try to make it make it uh, valuable. Um, and 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 the last thing I, I think it's good to say is that you know this book took seven years to write. So Holy cow! I wrote it. Yeah, I wrote a draft, and then that got thrown in the trash, and then just supporting this kind of stuff, I think is really important, right? It's, there's no, you know, big company behind me. I'm, you know, barely three, three people on my staff, you know, hardworking, getting out there doing stuff. So it's not, this isn't a big sort of, you know, Hey, let's try and see if this works. Literally it's, it's uh it's accumulation of, of 